Today on Spinecrackers, a difference of literary opinion threatens to tear the boys apart. Stay tuned for intense drama. Will the podcast survive? It was highly imaginative, just fucking overall pretty amazing. 4.48. I I was going to do a bit of a counterpoint and say that, like, I'm a little cool on this book. I'm going to go with a uh, a 3.4. Not to um, invalidate your experience or anything. So, like, ahead of her time. There's a really vulgar way to read this book. And that's off his rock. It's a, it's a 4.83. It's a masterpiece, and um, it's incredible. Fuck! One of the most traumatizing things that I ever went through was when I was living in Texas, and I had, I was a graduate student, and I had, like, no dollars. Right. You know, I had like, I literally had, I think I had like $36 in my bank account. I went to the grocery store and I bought a six pack of beer, which was a, a third of my budget, third of, <laughs> not, not my budget, my entire net worth. Right. And, uh, <laughs> and then I bought like, you know, like some fucking whatever mac and cheese and shit, like basic shit, beans, cans of beans and shit. Right. And I didn't have a car in Texas. So I only had my bike and the grocery store was close. So it wasn't oh, like no. whatever. So I have the, I have the plastic bags on my fucking handlebars and i'm driving this already going through the parking lot and i didn't even i didn't even fall or they didn't wreck or anything the bottom just fucking falls out of the beer the bag with the beer in it and just fucking sh- all the bottles just shattered all over the fucking, it was glass yeah glass which was stupid oh. on my part uh, oh god obviously that's, that's like that's on me to some degree that's well, a that's- home alone moment with kevin yes <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. think that's if we really want to get rich, we should market fucking yeah, parking lot proof alcohol containers. Right. I think it, maybe this was off the recording, but the the metric is going to be: can you drunkenly fall while carrying your booze to your car to drunk drive <laughs> <laughs> and have the bo- bottle not shatter? That's how tough everything should be. We do yeah. not endorse drunk driving on this podcast. Unless yeah, you've I mean, only, unless you've only had a few and you live real close and it's fine. And you live real close and you probably <laughs> drive a little better buzzed. <laughs> and you you know the cops in town. Because <laughs> you're a centrist. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right. The thing what group- I don't what I don't get though is that like, you know, alcohol, <laughs> why why is it sold in in glass form when people I mean there are drunk people out there that might drop the bottles why why not make it in plastic form like a gatorade well handles are <laughs> in plastic sometimes yeah that's like, true you can buy like gordon's and, and you're like seagram's or whatever that's all in plastic no no beer yeah. though i don't think as far as i know is in plastic is it because no. it's it fucks up the beer or something I, like i don't I well mean, the, that i mean a lot of um not to like go beer nerd not because this is but, your territory though so. but yeah most like most um you know, higher end sort of craft breweries don't put anything in glass except for like maybe uh, like a stout bomber every once in a while, because especially, especially if it's a, a lighter beer, like an IPA or something. Right. Um, the, the sun, if it's, if it sits in the sun for any amount of time in the glass, it'll fuck it up in the, in a glass bottle. That's the skunk. Yeah. Get, That's yeah, skunk exactly. Phenomenon. Yeah, exactly. It gets skunked. You got shelf turds getting skunked. <laughs> <laughs> they're just for show though a lot of the time yeah that, that is yeah. true some d- so so, like, coated in dust like yellow oh, yeah yeah ipas are just so like weak and soy <laughs> ipas are not soy <laughs> let me get Hipster some fucking soy. heady suds <laughs> yeah you want you want barley wine or whatever the like the barley shape. wine okay here's the thing i am I am definitely a kind of beer snob. This is what we're trying to tease out of you. (laughs) Uh, And barley wine is a very hot style. And uh, those, some of the big barley wine bottles are very, very expensive and rare and trade well and all that. Barley wine is fucking disgusting. And I could go the rest of my life without drinking one and be completely happy. I probably had wow. one. Let's hear it here first, folks. And hot frankly, takes. frankly, here's my other hot take. Belgian beer is also disgusting. Facts. Fucking facts, what's a, dude. 
what's a what's a belgian beer is don't they have some like mainstream beers okay so like so, yeah okay we should be a little more specific like the the whites and stuff are fine like i like a belgian white no big deal but like the fucking heavy like trappist like fuck, like yes. like like chimay and that that would be the mainstream type ones they're fucking gross and anyone who pretends to like them is lying well i think what happens is is I don't know if people are necessarily lying, but I know my own experience with those things. I mean, of course, I'll still fuck with like just like Blue Moon, you know? Yeah, occasion. that's a, yeah, like, that's a slightly different style. Yeah, but like the like Shime and like uh, the Orval, kinda, uh, like all that shit. The Cooperstown, what's that place? Uh, I can't remember the brewery in Cooperstown, New York. It's a uh, Trappist. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Um, With the gnomes. Uh, Omegong. Ba- Omegong uh, and stuff. Baseball, baseball Hall of brewery. Fame. Baseball beer. Hall of Fame brewery. <laughs> like, when, you know, when you're, if you are, like, trying to be, I just remember, like, for me, the trajectory as a New Yorker was, like, I'm I'm graduating. I'm actually, like, yeah. regarding beer. And so it's, it's like, a growing pain almost to, like, maybe drink that stuff. Definitely. Definitely. Or, like, all, or, like, the, uh. I forget the name of the brewery, but all those like um, fucking epic silvery labels like La Fin du Monde and all, 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 all that <laughs> stuff. Philosophers. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff. Uh, you, I think you're right, Matt. That's sort of for a lot of people. That's kind of like the first, like, oh my god. Especially, I mean, when we were coming up, starting to drink beer, it wasn't like as big as it is now, and so that really was kind of like the forefront of yes, craft beer. Um, and so we drank well, it, were, but it's crap. It's disgusting. Any- <laughs> in high school blue moon was like uh was pretty freaking like amazing right? yeah like, oh, sam adams blue moon? blue moon that was fucking fancy wow yeah, yeah. i remember bringing blue moons i'm like would anyone love a uh a orange wedge <laughs> and i was like i'm fucking i am mr peabody <laughs> i could i could see you mr. like deeds <laughs> Like walking into a fucking party with oranges. Yeah. Hey. Like a soccer mom after a match. Like, just would anyone like an orange <laughs> slice? Oh my God. Yeah. Just going Please to your friends. Like me. Just going just... to your like art friend's house and just being yes. like, yeah. Yeah. I brought some imports <laughs> and it's just fucking Blue Moon. Her fucking like, <laughs> her like, <laughs> fucking like, her was like Stella. <laughs> Right, just I don't like think Blue oh, Moon. Blue Moon's not important. I don't think you guys. I bought a. I, I brought some beers. They have corks in the top, which is pretty <laughs> sick. So, do you guys want to start watching season two of the L Word now? <laughs> I also, I also have this pack of cigarettes. It's called the Soft Pack. I bought it on eBay. Yeah, you guys want to smoke some? I actually brought cloves. They're not even cigarettes. It's pretty cool. I was gonna say it's definitely cloves. It's definitely cloves. <laughs> yeah, Galusha. I brought Galouches or whatever the fuck. What is that cigarette? The French ones. I don't know Galo- that one. Galo- Galoshes. Galoshes. Yeah, it's basically that. Whatever, man. This is an American podcast. We're not trying to say the words right. Well, speaking of art, uh, mm. we got a book to talk about this <laughs> evening. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. Believe it or not, on uh, a literature podcast, we do have a book to talk about. Welcome to Spinecrackers. My name is Gabe. I'm Matt. I am Paul. I'm the uh, the hot jock of the group. You can't see it right now, but Paul has glasses on and his hair slicked to the side. He looks just like fucking Clark Kent. It's awesome. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he looks, I basically am. I am Clark Kent. Uh, that is me. <laughs> Call me Clark. Paul me Clark. Call me uh, Clark. <laughs> Paul. I actually, uh, I've been drinking wine tonight like a like a, a housewife from 1950. So um, be warned a little bit. Listeners. Nice. There are uh, also housewives in 1950s or in the book, not the 50s, but around that time. <laughs> Very close. Um, so uh, lead us in. I'm just on. I'm on the segue train. Yeah, dude. Um, tonight we're talking about uh, a 1947 novel by British author Anna Kavan, uh, formerly um, Helen uh, Helen. Emily Woods, Woods is her birth name. Um, and she uh, had a really interesting life. Um, she was born in 1901, died in 1968, uh, born Emily Ellen Woods, as I said. Um, her father killed himself uh, when she was young. And um, that doesn't factor into this book at all. Um, just joking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she... Her 
her first husband that she that she was basically it was not it wasn't quite an arranged marriage, but her mother basically set her up with one of her her ex lovers. Insane. Which is gnarly. How old was she at the time? Do you know how old she was? You know, I was trying to figure out exactly how old she was when she got married first, but I couldn't find any any solid dates. She actually was a little bit kind of cagey in her life about like exactly when she was born or like the timeline of her of her life. I mean, by the by the time, right? Like the only thing I know is that like sort of by the end of her life, which was truncated a bit by drug use and stuff. Yep. She was just she was she was not exactly like she was she was crazy she was crazy yeah right? she i mean i don't know um if she was sort of you know she was her whole life she was plagued by heroin addiction and depression and she right. was institutionalized multiple times um and then later on in her life she was treated by some like pretty well-known kind of experimental psychotherapists and stuff people who were associated with freud and uh That's other it. That factors yeah. into my own thoughts about this book, actually. But okay, cool, good. That's I want to hear about it. Um, but I don't know if she was like in an in a in a particularly mentally unstable state at the time of her death, or just sort of at a place that was par for the course uh, for <laughs> for her, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, so so she writes a couple novels um, as as Helen Woods. Um, and then at some point after being institutionalized, I think for the first time and after her, uh, first child died, um, shortly after being born. So just as an, as an infant, um, she changes her name to Anna Kavan, um, which Anna was the, the, the heroine of her first two novels. So she essentially sort of takes the name of one of her own fictionalized characters, which, we can talk about that, I'm sure. Uh she would be such a fucking tumbler. <laughs> hey, don't don't like discount her by saying she could be popular not, on Tumblr. It's not a full discounting, but it's just like you know. She's a Chad, dude. She's a freaking Chad. She's a Chad. She is a Chad. What's a what is it? What's a like what's the term for just when you take on the personality of a character that you it's not a fursona. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Like it's like fix identity. There's yeah. There's definitely like fi self insert fiction, which is pretty fun. But like when that this weaves, is like when self... that weaves back, it's it's yeah. Yeah, this is like self extracted fiction. <laughs> That's interesting. Sort of like a uh, like Robert Downey Jr. Right? Doesn't he like say that he tries to be like. Uh... The guy Iron Man, Iron Man, yeah. Hasn't he, he? He, I think he said that he like tries to just basically be like that guy. Well, he's just he, method acting, though. He can it? come talk to us when he changes his legal name to Tony Stark. Yeah, when he when he lets us know that he's actually fucking serious about what he's doing. I hope he I hope he changes his name to Iron Tony. Iron Tony. Iron Tony. <laughs> <laughs> he's actually stopped. He's done, right? Like he he backed out finally of the contract, the life sentence with Marvel. Yeah. Yeah, he's done with Marvel, I think. Yeah, he I'm died sorry, in Endgame. Spoilers. Can continue with the biography. No, no, no. That's it. I mean, there's there's so so she changes her name at some point in the in the um, early 40s, late 30s, um, and she publishes a novel. I think in 1941, or a, or a, you know, a, a piece called Asylum Piece, sort of about, <laughs> you know. Right. what you would expect roughly um and she sort of in and out of of uh various types of asylums and institutions and stuff after that for heroin addiction for depression um she has another child die she gets married again gets divorced again damn um and uh you know uh, she writes one novel that gets sort of famous towards the end of her life ice which is sort of a um weird science fictiony uh novel about a, a a slab of ice covering earth essentially um I, that's i actually that's the that's the thing i knew about her right off yeah the yeah um i that's i think probably her most well-known work that's the only one that i had heard um of hers 
But I actually uh, retroactively realized that I had heard the title of this novel, Sleep Has His House, previously because there's like a, a, a neo-folk kind of like outfit, um, huh. Current 93, and they have an album called Sleep Has His House. And oh, I had fuck. listened to that many times and they're, they're, they're one of my favorite groups. Damn, you're, um, oh, fuck, I forgot about that. And, uh, or groups, I guess, whatever. It's mainly one guy, but. Yeah, insane front man kind yeah. of. Yeah, um, with rotating, sort of a rotating cast of characters. Sort of uh, a rotate, rotovator cast of characters. Okay, nice. <laughs> and I got it in. Uh, yeah. Also, didn't she, I think, I don't know, when I was looking up random stuff that she had done, like, there was another thing called, like, a, a, it, I think it was called Wheels in the Head. Yes, Wheels in the Head was recent, and I think that was recently, I don't know how recently, but New York Review of Books did an edition of that. Um, I don't really know much about it, but I saw it, and I think I may have made a meme about it. Sounds like Max Sterner. <laughs> Sounds like Sterner. Yeah, it does sound like Sterner. Crap. Yeah. So. So. That's interesting lady. A little bit about her. Yeah, fascinating lady. Fascinating uh, author, fascinating character. Lady is not something we say anymore. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> woman. You make me panic uh, for one femtosecond. How dare you? Just, <laughs> did you say fem, femtosecond? Yes, yeah, very intensely. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and, you know, when she changed her name, her writing style like dramatically shifted from sort of like more traditional kind of British kind of, you know, novelist writing about people in British society and blah, 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 blah. I haven't read any of her early work, so I don't, I can't describe it particularly accurately. But then when she changes her name, she sort of shifts to this kind of, you know, hazy surrealist, like very, I don't know if stream of consciousness is the right word. I don't think it's quite that, but it's certainly not, any sort of linear storytelling like in, in in most of her later work there are there are no named characters the order of events is not like particularly clear um and that's true of, the, of this book as well why'd you pick it i picked it i don't know i don't really have a good answer i i was kind of it showed up probably somewhere on some list or some recommended something and the title grabbed my attention and I had remembered seeing her name um, associated with ice, I think. And I was like, cool, that sounds cool. I'll read it. So, so you haven't read any of her other, other works? Nothing, nope, this is my first okay. one. Okay, okay. It was my first one as well. I assume it was Matt's too. Yes, sir. So yeah, um, yeah basically the, the, the book, the structure of the book is pretty simple. It's basically a, um, there's there's basically two parallel things happening. There's sort of these brief descriptions of, and, and this book is sort of like, we'll sort of see as we get through it, semi-autobiographical. It touches on some real events that happen in uh, Anna Kavan's life. Uh, there's, a, there's a parent suicide. There's time spent at a uh, boarding school, that sort of thing, um, things that, that actually happened to her. Um, and there's these brief sort of descriptions of those things. And then there are these, um, extended sections describing dreams, essentially, uh, and, and dr experiences had at night and in the mind of the narrator, who we only know as B, like the letter, as in the letter B. Um, and that's, that's basically the, 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 the structure of the book, uh, I think. Does that sound fair to you guys? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh it's it's hard to define it in a in a very structured plot outline for sure. There's um, there's like um it, it it covers a lot of time, I would say. Yes, like early childhood into like early like early adulthood, like about twenty, I would say maybe. Yep, that sounds like about that. right. Um, and then yeah, basically just these these brief little moments of kind of lucid more grounded description of some event or like just where she's at kind of in her life not really even placing her anywhere or describing like a lot of specifics and then there's these and then the bulk of the book is comprised of these like 
extended dream sequences that are i believe attempting to like you know g- give a give a sense of the ex- i don't know the the experiential i don't well, right like tone of of what it was to be in those situations in her head and and that kind of thing yeah yeah i would say yeah, yeah. definitely it's like you know the 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 writing in those sections is like self-consciously like overly flowery overly like just just wrought i would say and like to to the point that it was like i don't think i don't think maximalism is the right word but it's like really really um you know just vivid and like over almost overdone overextended like like harped on um yes flowery i don't know yeah minimalist almost in a way right because like it's so it's so broad and she's not trying to engulf hmm, i don't know this is a little bit counter uh signaled at the end but like she's not trying to like envelop the world which is like what i would consider a maximalist kind of encyclopedic style novel to be trying to do like i'm trying to explain the fucking you know the 90s with my book it's like uh her head yeah. It's her head only. Yeah, it's much more like uh it's much maybe phenomenological is a better word. I wish I knew what that meant more. It, it's clearly. it's just sort of it's sort of just trying to capture the essence of 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 a sub, of like a particular subjective experience. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I totally saw it as like a very uh um like individual's experience. It was very individual in this book, I I thought. Um, and I think to go back to the structure of the book, like the, the plot outlines and like the little tiny do- doses of, of information you get from her actual life are really small. And the majority of the book are these dream sequences. Yeah. So I mean, I, I would say, majority. so the book is like 190 pages. And I would say if you, if you add it up all of the like straight description of like her like quote unquote real life, what she comes to call her the day world in the course of the book versus the night world of the dreams. Um, if you tallied all that up, it would be like, I don't know what, maybe 15 pages, maybe 20. Right. Maybe, maybe. less, maybe like, <laughs> maybe like five. Like the, they're basically like one paragraph descriptions at the, at the beginning of each chapter, which they're not, there really aren't even even chapters. There's not um, really a story per se. It's just like, I, I think no. th- that ratio reflects what sh- what comes to be like the importance she gives the waking life and the dream dark world, I suppose, right? Like the weight she gives one versus the other is represented in the ratio that they appear actually in the novel. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Yeah. And I think that's definitely, because basically if there is anything that, that we could call a story or an arc to the novel, it's basically the the narrator B um, kind of gradually coming to accept and embrace the night world like more and more and reject the day world more and more over time. So like she sort of starts out just kind of like trying either trying to resist certain aspects of the night world and, and, and make compromises with what she calls the day world. So um, like if you but- watch like It's Always Sunny, <laughs> it's like imagine yes. if the day man was defeated by the night man. You exactly. know what I mean? Exactly. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what it's like. That's that's a good that's a good one. Yeah. I I think we had talked about this in text but like probably the strongest moment for me was and I think you all said it too like the most um affecting kind of passage was just the beginning of this book i don't i kind of want paul to read it yeah uh the, the first, I, like, I don't want to i don't want to read it no read it. Okay, read it not read it i think i'll just say before paul reads it like i i i, I agree with matt like this this opening passage is maybe my favorite in all of literature like just as a first i literally got I was hooked instantly and I just got goosebumps and continue to get goosebumps when I read it. Just, yeah, just like, we're not trying to overhype it. I don't know, because Paul has to read it and do it justice. <laughs> I have to read it and I, I have to read it and I drank almost a whole bottle of wine. So good. Here you go. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It is not easy to describe my mother, 
remote and scary. Starry? Starry? Starry. What is the word? Starry. Oh, poor boy. I'm smart. Remote and starry. Her <laughs> sad strange her sad stranger's grace did not concern the landscape of the day. Should I say that she was beautiful or that she did not love me? Have sh- have shadows beauty? Does the night love her child? I didn't do it justice at all. No, that was perfect. But, I just and yeah. I think that 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 sort of sets up kind of the other arc, character arc of the book is that this is essentially a book about a daughter and her mother, um, and their relationship and how it develops and ends. But it, yeah, but it, it, the whole relationship is like mostly through the lens of her dream world, which we, we keep calling it her like her night world or her her. It's to me, it's unclear whether it's like solely just dreams and, and she's just sleeping, or if she's just in this sort of like like she describes her environment as being like just like a dark room. She lives in her dark place. So when I was reading it, I was mostly reading it as a way of her like imagining these instances while also dreaming them um but she has this whole relationship with her mother through this dreamscape lens um and you get little instances through these little passages of what's like more clearly happening because the dream the dream world is not exactly clear at all it it, it's like it it goes from like one to a hundred constantly like you have to basically be on a ride and accept that you're on a ride to read these passages because they're like it's like reading someone's dream in in real time you know it's it's when i first started reading the book i was like i don't know i didn't know how i felt about it like i liked the first passage and i liked the first page a lot but i was like probably the first three chapters i was like wow this is like very thick heavy molasses dream world content that i don't (laughs) <laughs> no if i don't know if i can like get behind this but it it after a while i was like okay i just have to accept this ride that i'm on and once you do that you end up like experiencing the book in a way that i think it was meant to be experienced the mom dies no i i believe I, be, I believe yeah so she dies early on and i believe we're supposed to infer that she killed herself yeah because there's talk of of like spray and blood and like there's this there's like (laughs) there's talk of spray (laughs) matter arterial blood (laughs) yeah um and you know there's a, a a sort of ongoing kind of acknowledgement of both b and her father that like we're just not talking about this anymore ever like you i you know she talks about how this question this is a question i could never ask like how did my mother die how did like what happened to my mother and that was just sort of understood between her and her father and i think that that's her and i think that that that's one of the autobiographical aspects of the novel in that uh kavan's father did kill himself and i think that she's sort of drawing on that in in this as well you know what other random touchstone i would i would apply to this slightly but just you know because of all this 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 notion of like especially a house and whatnot is a haunting of hill house uh feeling that also like as like a decent like comparison essentially yeah actually i i actually thought i thought of actually uh i forget what moment but i actually thought of blind manor the second season in one particular moment and i was like wow this is better than blind manor the whole season in this one passage but i can't remember what it was but i it's interesting that we both thought of that because uh kavan is that how you say it kavan uh she's like she's like interacting in her mind with essentially like her her mom's ghost for the remainder of that and like that shit is creepy like she oh my god her when she's like looking out windows and then feels her like mother's spirit like uh you know, superimpose itself on her body and look out through her eyes. Or there was one random description, which was like when she looks out of a window in the dark and sees her face reflected in it, like she feels like a fisherman calling a fish up to the near, near to the surface of the water. And that's her mom's ghost like that. 
all that shit was so scary to me. Like, yeah, scary. there are like, like <laughs> some moments of le- of legitimate horror in this story for sure. Because yeah, at once once the mother uh, uh, dies, she starts showing up in in B's dreams as this kind of just black figure that that B refers to as A, uh, right? Um, in the dream world. And those are basically the only two characters. There's the um, the announcer guy who who is a recurring character. Uh, mm-hmm. I can't remember how, what, what his name is, how she describes him. We'll, we'll, there's, maybe, maybe we can talk there, about him. There's some sort of like police chief slash officer kind of guy. Yeah, he's like this military sort of um, who just sort of uh, every once in a while pops into her dreams to like read an announcement of some kind, which yeah. is, I thought really interesting. The liaison officer. Right. Right. And I thought that was a really interesting device that Kavan used too to sort of, we can talk about it because I think there are moments that the liaison officer says some really interesting things, but, but so one of the moments that stuck out to me most as horrifying and, and really creepy in the way that you were talking about was towards the end, I think when, there's this really elaborate like pages and pages of her describing this like Maypole, this like May May Day Fest celebration in this mm-hmm. like fantasy sort of almost like this fantasy medieval kingdom where I think, um, you know, B, I don't know if B is supposed to be a princess or something in this. No, she gets taken a shine to buy a princess. Right, 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 right. Um, and so there's this really detailed description of this this medieval town setting up festivities for like a maypole celebration and all that and like the description of of a this black figure just walking out and walking through and no one else notices her notices her except b it just gave me chills and it i I felt like it was some really well executed horror like like writing done in those bits the mom kind of sets the tone like i mean in a nature nurture sense, it seems like she really fucked it for A or B rather to uh to deal with the world. Like every time yeah, there's like but, oh keep go on, Paul. I but at the same time, I didn't really think that A was like too terrible of a person. I thought that she was like damaged and like a lot of mothers, she was just damaged in her own way. Do you get enough and, uh, though to to make even any judgment at all in any direction? I would I don't know. I think maybe you don't, but I mean, I thought that I got enough to just think that like this is a depressive mother, single mother, who like, not single. I think I well, she was single after. No, she oh never mind. No, uh, she she killed herself, not the father. Um, the father killed I, himself I in real life. IRL, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, I, I just thought that, like, I, I, I thought of her as just, like, a depressive person that didn't do a great job as a mother, but not any more terribly than any other depressive mother. Like, I didn't sympathize with her, but I also didn't think she was, like, the absolute worst human being that, like, beat B or something. You know no, 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 I, no. I don't mean that. I just mean that um, her her melancholy infuses the whole house and that like sort of darkened poisoned view of existence essentially as this kind of minatory sort of negative thing to be avoided and whatever it just it just seems to have uh infected b as well and like it, yeah it made her go down the path where she's like i'm a night creature you know i'm like a darkness i'm like yeah i am the bat you know what i mean like <laughs> i am the bat i'm just now yeah. now i'm just gonna be picturing v- b's voice as, as just christian bale batman well i mean she's called b that's because she's the bat <laughs> oh my god <laughs> I, you were uh, we're doing no. b again no. <laughs> Be you only adopted Dane. the darkness. <laughs> I was born in it. <laughs> uh, anyway, you work for, you work all of these me. motifs you work for me. <laughs> you work. You work for me now. Um, anyway, I, there's a passage I wanted to read just to, to to Matt's last point about the death of of B's mother of A, kind of suffusing, the, setting the tone for the rest of the story, and kind of suffusing the house because the house becomes. And I think this gets to Paul's earlier point about like the 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 permeability between the dream world and the real world uh, like because the house 
also become becomes the physical house that she grew up in where her mother killed herself, but also this house that she visits over and over again in her dream that sort of becomes her, you know, kind of place that she goes in the, in the dream world. Um, so this is on 45 and this is kind of in the dream be, you know, going up to her mother's bedroom, basically. Um, the staircase plods upward, flagging at every flight, the creaking tread sustained by dirt colored felt trampled threadbare. At the top of the back bedroom, dismal with furniture, discards from many rooms, cluttered with glasses, cups, empty whiskey and gin bottles, syringes, scattered tablets, powders spilled from their crumpled papers, needles, empty tubes labeled diamorph, etc., litter the floor. At the sash window, the dingy scum white lace with the entangled light strangling meanly in it. On the brass bedstead, huddled bedclothes in disorder, beneath which the stiff, frightening shape of some human form can barely inexorably be discerned. A wicked black frieze of cowls and chimney pots beyond the lightly air-sucked curtain, jagged angles of the roofs and gables iron sharp on the sky, the vacant, exhausted sky, like an old shell. And I just thought that that was just such a like dark tone. And that's early on in the book. That's like 40 pages in. And that basically sort of sets up the relationship between A and B for the rest. Yeah, yeah kind of do this dance and are sometimes not even necessarily different people. Yes, right. Yeah, it basically becomes that... a an, an extended, um, like melancholy nightmare on Elm Street, where where A is sort of pursuing B through her dreams and like seemingly attempting to like in some places explicitly drag her to hell. And and like bring her to these these awful places. Yeah, it, it was it was very horrific to to know that B, she's like trying to like have some sort of safe haven or sanctuary through her dreams, and like her mother kills herself, and she she can't escape the thought of her mother in her uh, her dreamland, which she holds as like sanctuary, basically. Like she, she, she's trying to escape the evils of the, the, the light world or like the day world. Um, but in doing so, she can't really like mask out what is haunting her most about the day world. Yeah. There's, there's, there's not really an escape. I actually like found this book to be pretty, uh, bleak in the sense that like, I, I almost feel like Kavan regarded the experiment itself as a failure and uh, that the, yeah, the escape as, as such, it doesn't happen. Like, like the person, you know, B just finds herself. Um, and I, I feel like this is like more, this is clarified in like the second half. Like there's a lot more of these questions about like authority or whether it's even uh, matters to ask these questions or try and differentiate yourself from, you, you know, normal society, blah, blah, blah. But like, it feels like it's a failure overall. Like the, like the, like she hasn't escaped shit. She's kind of, by the end of the book, she's kind of questioning what even caused her to ask these questions and go down this path to begin with. And like, I don't know, man, this book felt very sad and defeated, in my opinion, by the end. Well, yeah, I mean, especially after knowing her, the the author's history, like Gabe, Gabe told me before the podcast started about her. History, I didn't know anything about her. So reading it blindly, like I did, I I actually read it more as like, not as depressing. I thought that I thought that her dream world and her night world was actually like, almost like a, a place where she could find sanctuary and meaning for herself. Um, but because her, her mother infiltrated that world to, to such a high degree, it, it turns out to me to be more of like a coping mechanism that failed. Like she, like an extreme coping, like an agoraphobic. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, <laughs> yeah. Is agoraphobia. Which, and... <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but still, I, e even so, I, I, I do think that she, uh, even though 
the whole aspect of it is tragic and her mother haunted her. I do think it's a, a unique display of how you can find meaning in as an individual. Like I, I thought that she was very unique in, within herself and found a way of living in the world that was very like sterner. Like I'm going to, I'm going to create this world for myself and um, live in it and deny the rest of the world. And I, most of the time when I was thinking of what I was thinking about this, when, when the little like, um, paragraphs before a chapter started, I was like, yeah, she's having a tragic life, but she's, she's like living it in a unique way and finding meaning in her own way. Even if, even if her life is sad, she's doing it in, in a unique, in a unique way. I don't, I, I, I don't know. But, I didn't but, think of it as being as tragic, even though the whole, like her whole life was tragic. I, unique okay maybe not tragic but uniqueness doesn't necessarily bring any sort of you know it, it doesn't it doesn't cause you to be to have your anxieties assuaged or to bring you comfort necessarily even though it's like something new i i i, I felt that the book was was sad like she failed i there's a there's a passage in i, I have a pdf so it's like page 21 or something but like where so it's early on you know when when you're more in her child moments like when she when when i think the book kind of sours it's like the discovery of the dream world the kind of um sinking into it and then there's when it's like firmly established and then uh you know itself becomes almost like it has its creature comforts and whatnot, but she's questioning why they are creature comforts in the first place. And like, she's flitting between the day and the night world. And uh, she gets burned by the day world and goes back to the night world, but it's still not, it's lost some of its luster already. But like, so on page 21 of this PDF, uh, I just wrote the phrase idiot God, uh, because it already seems like she's kind of describing the fact of this kind of uh, the accidental creation of things made in the least romantic terms possible so like uh it, it starts um it, you know there's this image of this scientist super preoccupied with his studies and he goes he doesn't see the face watching him through the window the cretinous grin under the shapeless straw hat full of holes the village idiot peeps in round the post of the open door grows bold seeing the old man so absorbed and cautiously tiptoes into the room the idiot boy advances in shambling stealth a little nearer the table where something is spluttering over a burner. Cunningly keeps his eye on the reader, jerks himself nearer still. He is attracted by the bubbling mess in the tube, then fascinated by it. His hand stretches slyly towards it, draws back, fumbles to it again. He twitches in violent excitement, grimacing at it, clutches it, and the whole bag of tricks flashes up at, this t at his touch in an explosion of glittering dust. There's a split second glimpse of the vast, sad blackness of infinity before the perfectly bare void is spattered by this glittering exurgence, this bursting fountain of molecules instantly crystallizing to sequence of differing size. And now at once begins the fiery development of comets, suns, planets, nebulae. And uh, that's a creation myth, I feel like. And uh, one that is not entirely positive. It's like you have someone who is like, capable trying to get it just right and then literally uh, a, a drooling moron comes in and just initiates the creation of the world and that's how she kind of views maybe the daytime I don't, I don't know yeah i think she 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 has this this sense that it's i mean i think it's this classic sort of thing of like of wanting control, you know, like wanting some sense of control and of course she loses control in the night world too like she's pursued by her her mother and she winds up constantly in these, you know, there's this recurring room with like these weird occult scrawlings on the wall. And like, there are, are uh, tigers sort of pursuing her, like both in the night and the day realm, it's se seemingly. Yeah. Um, and I think there's some really interesting passages about that. But I think, yeah, I think that you're right, Matt, in the sense that she views the night world as this, I don't know this place of control this place of kind of 
just that, that it's just limited and that limitedness is a good thing um i guess it's the question is like why why yeah. why did why does she see this place as as different in in such a positive sense compared to the day world like what, I, I don't are, i don't i don't think she sees it as positive I, I i agree with you in in that i think that that it's a I think maybe briefly at the beginning, it's a sort of positive escapist thing, but it quickly veers off from that for me. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think she sees it as like the lesser of two evils. Like the, yes, that's yeah. That's, I think, I think that's a better way to put it. Yeah. I think she, she saw like, especially before her mom died, I think she had more control over the world. And once she died, she still holds on to the fact that she did have some control over the day, the night world. And she sees the day world as just like, over, like it could overcome her at any moment because it's it's like too real for her there's a um there's a passage early on that i think speaks to some of this paul some of what you're saying um and it's it's there are moments in the book that i think are really interesting and some of the not not my favorite parts but some of the most interesting parts where it's her sort of questioning herself and thinking her own sort of internal thought process thinking about all these things and so for the physical copy is 54 relatively early on. Um, and this is sort of her talking about, um, talking about the, the night world and the, the sort of life she's crafting for herself. It says, is it lonely? Sure. It's lonely. That's what you asked for. Didn't you? After all, if you hadn't been too superior for the gang, you wouldn't be here and think how much more distinguished it is to be on your own or with one or two individualists like yourself than to be an ordinary gregarious animal going about with the herd. You miss the sun and air? Sure you do. There are some million miles of, of solid obstruction between you and the free place where the wind blows and the birds sing in the sunshine. You'll never, you'll never feel the sun warming you anymore. You'll never hear the birds. No bird could live in this atmosphere, this ersatz air that eddies here in stale and fetid artificial gusts, but you can breathe in it and like it too. And in the end, you will smell sweeter than a sea breeze, sweeter to you than a sea breeze, just as this dim, unvaried, and unfresh light will suit your eyes better than the vulgar sun. You don't like it here. Uh, why didn't you keep out then, for God's sake, while you had the chance? Anyhow, it's no good moaning and sniveling now. Put a good face on it. Be tough. Show the crowd you can take it. You're an individualist, aren't you? To hell with the crowd. What do you care about them? You're here because you've got no time for the crowd. What do you care about them and their damn fool heaven? To hell with heaven anyway. And I think that sort of speaks to kind of what you, what you were getting at before, Paul. Yeah. Dan, that's a good passage. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, that's delicious. It, it, like the whole book was delicious. To me. Get that it's coffee. Like Indian, or er, uh, no, what, what's his name? Action Bronson? The rapper? Get on the pod. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah, I get it. Fuck, that's delicious. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Took me a second. Took me a second. I mean, to to be a simpleton philosophy connoisseur, I went to art school. Blah blah blah. Um, I was thinking a lot about uh, like while she's in the dream world. I was thinking about. Uh, I think. I think. Therefore, I am. Um, like she she has this world within within this nightscape that she's developed and she she holds a lot of meaning in this world and i i just kept thinking that like good for good for fucking her she's even though there's a lot of tragedy happening within it she's uh developed this world within her within her world that is giving her some sort of peace and should I should I say that it's just a coping mechanism? Should I say that it's like wrong for her to do so? And I, I was most of my thoughts were just like, no, like she she's doing what she has to do and it's okay. Well, and there is this additional thread, and I and I don't know if what if this exactly relates to your to your point, Paul, or to your take, but there's a, a thread that's pursued um at some length in a couple of sections where she's sort of expressing her views about truth and reality and that there is the idea that there's one sort of reality that there's one truth is is this you know laughable joke essentially and that that there's no you know everything is true at some point in history for some person in some context yeah. right 
I, yeah, there's a that was the opening of one chapter, and uh, I highlighted like the whole page and a half. I think it's like it's worth reading because to me it was like the aspect of the whole book, like what is true and what is true to each individual. Um, how I mean, just to push back a bit on that though, like again, I mean, I feel like the night world is is another explanation for like hypertrophied kind of like subjectivity and again if we're saying that it didn't really bring her to uh, to a place of peace whatever that means you know what i mean or ju or just like and to a place where the tensions of 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 all those questions are something that she can even deal with still or they're still just kind of painting her I don't know. I, I it feels like that kind of notion of of leveling of all that stuff uh, doesn't I, it doesn't aid her in any way. It's like not necessarily well, good. It's you know the day world is like what interacting with people and 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 whatever, and like the night world is just like her brain. Yeah, I mean, t for me, it's hard to think about this now that I know the author's history a bit. Like before, before I knew the author's history, I was I was more like on par uh, on par with with the fact that this is like a fine world to live in if you're lonely and just like want to escape the re reality. But because I know that she was a heroin addict and that she had a a terrible life and did like kind of objectively fail miserably in her personal life, I I don't know. But that's some Jordan Peterson shit, right? Because we can just say the same thing that well, you're saying I, about that life. Like, who cares? Well, like, who, like, what? Who's to say that she wasn't happy? Well, that's what I'm. That's my point too, though. Is that like, I, I'm still holding on to this aspect that, like, yeah, according to Jordan Peterson, her life would be a miserable failure because she's like living this world, not in the real world, quote unquote, where she's Ter not terrible able phrase. to like. She's not like living to help other people or be a part of her community and all this bullshit. But I don't know. She's finding meaning in her own way. I think the I the, the the major thing though, well, all I mean is that like it's not even a big deal that she doesn't succeed. It's just like uh she's not arrived at a, a at a a conclusion that is bringing her a, a, any sort of I don't know how to fucking equilibrium or like like what's most interesting to me uh are the moments when she's kind of tussling with it a little bit more yeah like, i agree and I, I and i think that that she creates i think the liaison officer is one sort of character that she creates to have those discussions with herself like um, gabe gabe do you remember that part where uh it's like um she's describing like the grounds of this beautiful country estate right and like this this metaphor goes on for a while of like the usefulness of it as a place curated by like an individual who is insanely dedicated to the aesthetics and like the love of it you know based on a purely subjective sense of the values of beauty and sym symmetry and blah 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 versus um allowing others to come and also partake in 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 this kind of like the riches of this land. Uh, hmm. I wish and I had and highlighted that, some uh, portion of it, but like I, that, that I, I, that's, I have it. I have it. That's that to me feels like a a a pretty like direct, uh, bit of inner conflict. Like and and that discussion is 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 framed. I mean, there's some really. I I want to. I want I I may want to table this for a second because I just wanted to make a point about what you guys were talking about before, but. There's some really interesting political discourse in this book, like because that discussion you're talking about, Matt, is yeah, totally is explicitly framed in terms of private ownership versus collective ownership, mm -hmm. and it it's pretty extended and like really really interesting. And I I think that's that um, monologue is the liaison officer speaking, if I'm not mistaken, and then he comes back again later, yeah. much later in the book, and sort of is talking about. Um, you know, obeying versus evading laws and like what is the nature of law and mm -hmm. and that sort of stuff. And I think that is all really interesting and worth talking about. And I, I don't want to table it for like 30 seconds because I just wanted to point out that I'm not sure like 
I guess I'm sort of missing what what you guys think is fruitful about this like disc the, the way of framing this as like does she succeed or fail because I don't really understand I don't that's I don't really see that as like the the axis of 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 meaning here like I guess I don't really know what we're talking about when we're talking about succeed or fail at what like not not I would I would say not fail you know I, but uh rather enter into a mode of thinking in reaction to one thing and thinking that like she's found solutions and finding out that that's not also necessarily true and now being uh in the kind of like i don't know the the, the way more under like relatable and kind of like human work of of squaring that circle and like negotiating the tensions like arrived at from you know wh wh what she's been taught what she believes what's been said to her like was she corralled into this sort of realm and now she's starting to see the the cracks in that and how she might have been duped into behaving in certain ways and just kind of the never-ending process of trying to negotiate your your identity and, and being in the world yeah and, that, and I do, like she yeah. did just like escape I mean, into the dream world and and feel good and that's what i mean by fail is not right. not necessarily failing but like she just did she didn't escape into the dreams and feel good yeah right yeah and i mean I do, I, I do i was just gonna say i do appreciate paul's sort of generosity and in interpretation because i think there's like a really there, there there may be a temptation for some people because there's a really vulgar way to read this book of, about in the sense that it's Oh my God! It's just a, a, a another crazy woman writing about being crazy, right? And I think that it's it's really helpful to try to kind of interpret it in a way that's not that, because I think it's not that at all. But it, that that would be a sort of really lazy, kind of vulgar way to read it. That it in some ways invites um, maybe a little bit more if you know about Kavan's life. But but I think it's important to like try to find alternative ways of reading it, which I think are more fruitful. Yeah. Yeah. I think that my perspective of it was that like, as a depressed person who has been depressed on occasion, I feel great now, by the way. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think that coping, but coping can be coping can be living. So like, if you find a way to cope and you're living your life and everything's just like working out and you, you haven't killed yourself, uh, you found a way to to go through life, and I think that that was how I was reading a lot of a lot of this book was that like I wasn't like judging her at any at any point. Only only in retrospect was I judging her in a way that like okay, a person that was like Jordan Peterson would read this book and think they were an insane person that is just totally off their rocker and not engaging in the real world. And they need they they need a total wake up call. And I I didn't read it in that way at all. I thought I I, I thought it was just more of an an extremely introspective way of living a life. Um, even if even if there was tragedy and hellscapes within her dream world, she was living it in the way that she knew how. So I I, I thought she was kind of a uh, Gryffindor. No spoilers whoa okay chill <laughs> <laughs> now no one has any reason to listen to the rest of this podcast yeah they've been yeah. <laughs> they're holding their breath for an hour and 45 minutes until they get they get the real stuff <laughs> the whoever's edit whoever's editing that uh this podcast just delete that what i said we oh, don't we uh, don't have an editor we don't i could but i'm not gonna uh <laughs> Yeah, follow, I, us on, I, follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Our YouTube <laughs> channel, YouTube channel coming soon. I, again, I don't. I'm not trying to like pass a sort of a, a, a summary judgment on this person. It's just um, I ended up liking the book more towards the end. I was a little bit not on board for like a solid like half of the book because I was mostly just worried that it was going to be uh like someone describing their successful escape and like i wasn't regarding it as that and when it started to like 
become more complex, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I appreciated that. I actually felt it was more human for that. Yeah. I think it's, I think that's the other kind of like vulgar way to read this or one other vulgar way to read this, which is just sort of like, Oh yeah. It's just like a weird Alice in Wonderland fantasy trip down some creepy, like weirdo dreams. And it's also not that like, I think Matt, you're right. I think that it's, it's, it's much more human. It's much more real. And it's much more kind of like um, true to life in the sense that like, it, it, you know, our, too often our, the things that we consider to be escapes from everyday life, which by implication is bad or negative or something that we want to escape. Right. The escapes themselves turn out to be just as bad, if not worse. And I think that's <laughs> definitely the case here. Yeah. And, um, and who's to say that either way of living is is a bad way of living? I, I, I Jesus just Christ. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jesus, dude. Yeah, and I I discount that theory. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think he means by that? Jesus. Yeah. I think that. I don't know. Jesus probably wants you to live in the day world and help other people. And... <laughs> Jesus is the day man. Jesus. Jesus. Day man. <laughs> Jesus. Day man. <laughs> Master of the Satan. <laughs> which I... one of the which one of them molests kids again? I forget. The night man. Oh, shoot. The night man cometh, which is a joke. Uh got it. You have to pay it's the troll joke. toll. If you want to get in the boy, if you want to save the boys hole. Right. And yeah. in, but in real life, the troll toll is tithes at a Catholic church. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get a sense of her religious affiliation, which I find interesting. For not her. at all. Not at all. An early 20th century uh, English. It seems like kind of wealthy uh, young girl. Yep. But, yep. Um, fuck. I had, I had, I had something. Someone else talk. I had. Well, I, okay. So I'm oh. I'm curious about what you guys took from in terms of the the political aspects of the book because there's this early discourse about collectivism and private property ownership. Later on in the book, when there's I wouldn't say like it's a new character, but it's like a new description of perspective where there's this like weird like Sauron cosmic mm -hmm. eye kind of flying around and just like right. viewing all of history in this like one panoptic moment. But but like it, there's there seems to be a sort of obsession with like war and violence and like perpetual human suffering that is just being observed by this kind of like it really did remind me of Sauron's eye just kind of like like yeah. like scrolling but it's but it's temporal right it's like scrolling through history rather than looking around a, a physical space. Um, yeah, so and, and, Sauron is is Enron. <laughs> that's cool. that's cool whoa whoa dude fuck the smartest guys in middle earth dude fucking ronald mcdonald but he's got an ak-47 <laughs> <laughs> we <laughs> ad busters and and and, nu and the codes to the nuclear system we are we are culture jamming right now yeah instead of the big red button it's his nose and he pushes it and it launches the nukes. wink <laughs> wink <laughs> what what if what if that was a new the nuclear codes? It was just Ronald McDonald's face, and it was a big red nose button. That, that if we if we had awesome. a time if we had a time machine and knew anything about graphic design, we could make millions off of ad busters in the early two thousands. <laughs> Dude, so true. <laughs> uh, Bush era would have loved us. Dear God, just like we would have literally been commissioned to design a Green Day album cover. <laughs> <laughs> well 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 Gabe to your point I mean I, I would say the, the two the two monologues are that I was thinking of a more political view were the yes, was the uh beginning chapter about truth and the monologue about the estates and landlords uh I didn't really think about it in terms of like the the great eye of Sauron I, I think that like went over my head at that point. But well, I just thought I just thought the Sauron I thing was interesting because it seemed like whenever he was mentioned, the 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 folk or I don't know he it whenever the, that perspective was taken, 
um, it seemed to focus on like acts of like horrific violence and war and human suffering. And I just wondered if maybe there was a political kind of twinge to that as well. That feels theological. I, I don't know if that feels political even like I in so okay in 2666 right the Bolaño book there's like a random image of like Oscar this, Meyer Oscar Meyer's famous most famous book there's the there's the image after this whole like Juarez fucking women being murdered in mass for no reason of like uh, uh, the sky being looking like the closed eyelid of a gray giant or something like that. And like, you know, essentially inviting the idea of maybe like an absent God or something like that. This feels like the opposite. It's like something that's actively observing and, and still ignoring uh, these, these horrific acts of violence. And I mean, yeah, like you said, this book was made in 47. So like, uh, when was the atomic bomb dropped? But it's referenced in this book. Like 47 right or 46 was it like pretty contemporaneous with like when she was probably writing it yeah at the definitely. very least uh when did the enola gay ride dry, ride over it was 45 45 so right? yeah okay. she she would have had some time to uh marinate on that for sure but there there's some pretty like oh current kind of like shit in here definitely like you know on top of i would say Again, as somebody, you know, as a person who apparently went through Freudian analysis, I think, uh, I think it's 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 almost maybe like lame to say that like re- like the the interpretation of dreams. No, like is that <laughs> like no? Yeah, not at all. Right. She he, Freud was kind of like popping off, sort of delayed, but like popping off right now. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. And and Kavan later in her life after this book was published, but, you know, I have to imagine that her interest in this kind of thing extended, um, you know, before that, uh, one of her therapists, I forget his name off the top of my head, I have it pulled up in a tab somewhere, but um, he was a close friend and associate of Freud, one of the guys that she was, became close with as a, as a therapist. So when you're talking about like politics, like for instance, the collectivist versus uh, private ownership thing, uh, there, there, there's a one little chunk that tries to fuse those things, and it goes as follows: uh, Would it not be possible to evolve some system under which the status quo could be maintained, perhaps until the death of the present proprietors? Meanwhile, raising the educational standards so that the general public will be fitted both to administer the estates efficiently and to appreciate them to the greatest advantage. I that's kind of like where she lands in, in that little bout of inquiry which is um you know a more educated polis is what i would describe that as as being a suggestion yeah and i i just think i I thought that whole section was so humorous and funny like i mean there was a there was a bit right before just where you read matt where um the guy but and this is the the liaison officer who is a dream creation um of of b who I don't know. Is one of maybe the most interesting character in the book for me. I'm like, <laughs> why? Why is this the 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 thing? The sort of interlocutor that her mind creates for itself. It's probably her inner god. Yeah. Right. But so just before that, he says, "Of course, sure. nobody. Of course, nobody denies that the good things of the world should be equally accessible to all, and that the owning of property by individual individuals is, in theory, deplorable. But it seems to me that careful consideration <laughs> should be given to the case of the landowners, who far more often than not are hardworking, hardworking, abstemious men of high moral principles." And then, right after you read, it says. Uh, don't think I'm attacking the common people or condemning their high spirits. All I want is to make sure that they don't lose sources of future pleasure through receiving them prematurely before they have had opportunities of learning to appreciate their true worth. That's why I'm entering this plea on behalf of the old landowners. I just thought it was, it's such a weird take and it's so interesting. And uh... well, it's also weird in like accordance to the actual structure of the book too. Cause like most of the book, as we said, is just her dreamscape and little aspects of her her actual waking life um so to have that to have these little like political aspects to the passages come out in this way were were, like jarring and it made you focus on them too it made you think like these are her actual political beliefs 
Yeah. Yes. I, I totally agree. I think, I think structurally, especially that first passage. Well, I mean, cause the, the, the bit about truth, I think comes before the first liaison officer monologue. Uh, yeah. And, and, but, but they're both jarring in sort of similar ways because I think you're right that they kind of come out of nowhere as like, so we get these, these sort of like, you know, slice of life, like vignette moments about her going to her boarding school or, you know, how she interacts with her dad or like walking around the house with her mom, not there or whatever. And then we get these like very phenomenological, like um, not, you know, like surreal descriptions of dreamscapes and like it, 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 that sort of thing. And then all of a sudden we're getting like this discourse on truth and then collectivism and private ownership. Yeah. And it's just like, it, you're right. It is really jarring in the structure of the book and the tone of the rest of the book too. And I thought that was worth noting and kind of thinking through. Well, definitely because I, I think that like one of the strongest aspects of the book to me was that like, it goes against normal structure to such a hardcore degree. Yeah. Like, Especially for 1947. Yeah. She fucking owned it. I thought that like, like the structure is just so out there. Like it, and it's uh, to me, it's just like, it's a, it's slightly genius the way that she just like disrupted normal structure. It was just like I'm gonna I'm gonna write a book and I'm gonna create my own structure the way I see a book should be written. And to interject those little moments of political, I don't know, like her own personal beliefs or just like what she wanted to write politically or philosophically when it comes to the truth passage. I thought they were like really awesome accents to the whole story that like fit in very perfectly. And without yeah. them, I think, I think the book would have maybe been docked about five points. <laughs> or <laughs> damn, that's heavy. <laughs> yeah, that's a no, not, high not, toll. Not not five points. I meant like whatever point five. Whatever. But I, I totally agree that, yeah, like I was saying that structurally it's really jarring and interesting that those bits were included. And I just think that the device of this sort of like dream military officer just coming in and reading these these edicts was really like brilliant and interesting. Because we I guess we do have to like maybe like this is an adult. There's, a, there's another uh, like kind of filtration system layered over the fact of having maybe like, you know, had these dreams and done these things, right? Like it's a post hoc interpretation of her past. And I, I, she was kind of conducting a, a sort of experiment as well, right? Potentially psychoanalytic uh, with the writing of the novel itself. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think definitely, I mean, it, it's, it's like, you know, I mean, we were, we just sort of briefly mentioned this, um, when you stepped away, but it, for for 1947, like what a what a bizarre kind of fusion of like you know dream journal and like surrealist fiction and memoir and like it's it's it, it, you know it's just touching on so many things um, just structurally. Someone someone uh, in uh, the Goodreads comments uh, brought up like the the question of whether or not uh burroughs read this before naked lunch just i could totally see it a thing that was kind of doing you know a bit of what he was doing um, yeah i mean i think that this has to be this has to be put up there with those sorts of texts in terms of like what it's what it's accomplishing structurally and in terms of just kind of the writing but did you guys not get a sense of frustration with the experiment itself basically this is basically like when i say failure this is maybe more what i mean is like this experiment was initiated and by the end of the book i was kind of like getting a sense that she was like i don't know if i'm really getting what out of this what i was hoping you mean that, you mean her as in kavan her the author. irl yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 i mean i do think i do think you know one thing that sort of uh bolsters that 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 feeling or that interpretation is that i i do feel like one of the few weaknesses of the book for me is that i feel like it kind of ends abruptly i kind of wanted not that i not that like abrupt 
abruptness would be bad, but it's kind of just like, you know, well, I gotta, it, I mean, I think the last paragraph is literally like, well, I gotta stop sometime, so I'm stopping now. And that's, that's basically how it ends. Um, so and, there's, oh, this is great. Actually, there's a passage. So right. like in an 86, page 86 or whatever of the PDF fucking, I, 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 I highlighted it just because there's, um, again, she's going, she's launching into a highly descriptive dream sequence. Uh, and at some at one point she just goes, there's no need to describe the splendors of the palace, the statues, the winging staircase, the columns, the balustrades of marble and onyx and ag ag agate, I don't know how to say it, uh, and porphyry. What's the use of talking about the grandeur of the ballroom, the elegance of the dancers, the skill of the orchestra? Such things are better left to the imagination so that everyone can fill it in for themselves, <laughs> which details they find most satisfactory. And like, to me, that was almost like a a, a, a bit of a, like I'm kind of frustrated with this granular analysis of the imagery going on in my head. I, I also think, I think that's plausible. I also think there's a lot of comedy in that because, <laughs> because what a funny thing to say about something that is itself of the imagination, right? That, that it, the, the imagining of it is better left to the imagination. <laughs> <laughs> like that's just hilarious to me. Yeah. But you can see how she starts. I, I, you, you, I, I kind of like the experience of her, um, the, like the experience kind of like involuting back onto itself a bit, which is kind of cool. Yeah, it's definitely a, you know, I think uh, particularly towards the end, as you were saying, Matt, I think that like Kavan herself comes through more and more as you, you know, get deeper and deeper into these these descriptions of dreams and like you know, uh, seemingly some of them kind of reflecting her experience of writing the actual book. Yeah, it's, almost, it's a little uh, Charlie Kaufman. <laughs> Philip Seymour Kaufman. Philip Seymour Kaufman. <laughs> the mascot of Hall's Cough Drops. <laughs> Yo, do you guys, my, my favorite dream of all time in this dream book, though, is the woman who breastfeeds the ventriloquist dummy and her oh my and her nipple is a cock. <laughs> and she just feeds it milk until it turns into an adult man. <laughs> Paul, Paul, you're muted. You're muted, Paul. <laughs> yeah, I just said, yeah, fuck. That was great. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know about you guys, but I, I, like, this is what I want. If someone's going to write or make a film about dreams... This is the kind of thing I want. It's just this like is the content, exasperated like imagery, on top of in imagery that is just like you don't even have to understand it. Really, you just have to be on the ride for it. And <laughs> it made me think of uh, of uh, Paprika, the anime movie. Have you guys oh, seen that? Fuck yeah, dude! Yeah, I was thinking. Of, I was thinking of Paprika because I was like, this is what dream sequences could should be. It's just like fucking off the walls craziness and i was actually i was thinking of inception too and how it didn't do that at all uh right paprika is the good example inception's the bad one the and also it, inception actually like stole imagery from in, uh paprika like the velvet carpet in the hall it doesn't matter but yeah 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 for someone to um to put pen to paper in 1947 about dream and imagery to this magnitude i thought was just fucking awesome like i'm not sure if we've talked enough about in our discussion how like dream heavy the book is it's like 90 percent you're just reading about this woman's dreams yeah and you just have to like accept what you're reading because a lot it, of the times you don't understand reality it. gets <laughs> ratioed so hard yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I think Paul, you're right to harp on it because, like, I I have not. I thought the the way she captured just the the feeling of dreams was. I mean, it was one of the some, one of the best ways that I've ever read it discussed. It was like so, just phenomenologically accurate to at least my experience, where you just shift, like the imagery shifts so seamlessly and casually and you don't think about it at all, right? Like it's just sort of, 
at, you know, one minute you're in this mayday parade at a, at, a, at a castle and the next minute you're watching like Leviathans devour the moon from a lighthouse and it's totally normal and fine. And like, I, I, I just felt like her, just the way she wrote it felt so true to me. Well, you know, you know, it's yeah. wild though too, is like, the other thing is that there's this whole like, final it feels like there's a sort of final fourth wall breaking where an audience is watching her describe the dreams and the entire time i was reading the book i was noting down all of the like uh, uh fucking like uh references to film language like filmic language in 47 which again you know it's, it's early for film and like like cut like constantly describing things as cutaways and fucking close-ups and like and now we shift focus to this and that it's all very like camera based in terms of like how it's described uh which is only something that she could have done as an adult like considering her child like slide into this into her 20s you know what i mean like again like to emphasize the fact that she was older writing about this span of time of probably 15 years or so. Yeah, I think that's a really, really fascinating point. And, and I would, I think there's probably a lot there because I was thinking the same thing. Like this is so, you know, filmic. And, and there, like, I was thinking of even like, um, you know, dream depictions of film. I mean, hold on, there's a, uh, I mean, I felt like she even has like a description of like, editing in some ways we yes. can splice together images like on 83 you know at the bottom she's just sort of running through these sets of images you know flyers bellboys witch doctors scientists typists waiters beauty queens parsons racing cyclists whores sandwich men cooks schoolmasters prize fighters chinamen we the, apologies um, yeah, the n-word the n-word's in the book too so. yeah yeah uh yeah kings these people can be rearranged indefinitely to include any combination as they waltz or shuffle or glide or Roomba or tango or walk or whirl or whatever across the screen. Yes. And it's like, basically she's describing the, the process of like editing a movie. I just thought it was really like fascinating. And then at the end, it's, it's just, it's like the end of fucking Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Like they just ride their horses through the movie screen and they're in an audience or like in a soundstage or whatever. Yeah. Which again I, is, is not a vote of confidence for the dream world, in my opinion. I kind of love it actually. Like I, I, love, I love the it. ending of my I love I mean Gabe said that he didn't really like the the abrupt ending, but I actually like I find it really fitting. In the same way that I uh, that I find Monty Python and the Holy Grail fitting the ending of that it's just what? like you you had this experience it had to end at some point and it's going to end right now so but it has it to is. end Here's in this ending. in this involution absurd involution of awareness of awareness it which is kind of but you're just called it fitting right so like you mean that that was satisfying to you and and that and that that's what that was was like when you sort of admit to the medium in which you're trying to tell a story, you've already done something like postmodern, essentially. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, but I mean, to, to say it's postmodern is like one way to put it, but I, I would also say it's like, like my favorite form of art in any respect is like if someone sets out to make a book or a painting or anything with an idea of like i want to figure something out about myself mm -hmm. and if i come if i come to that conclusion or no conclusion and if i if I, if I feel satisfied with that i'm gonna stop and i kind of feel like that's what she did she was like i figured something out maybe it wasn't like satisfactory maybe it was, didn't make me happy but i figured something out i'm gonna i'm gonna I'm going to stop right now. Fair. And I found if, that, that, if, that, I, if that thing made her throw her pen down and stop, it's still a valid conclusion, right? And it's all, that's the only difference I'm trying to say is she's like, fuck! And she threw her pen down. And that's kind of like the vibe of the end of the book. I think it's interesting to think about like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And potentially. I don't, I don't know though. It's like, it's hard. And, I, and I'm, I'm trying to read the book in a way that is like, 
away from the artist, which is the way I read it. Um, so when I read it, it felt organic. It felt like a natural conclusion, even though it was abrupt. I was like, all right, she said what, what she had to say. And all right, I'm okay with that. I got I got what I think she wanted me to get from this. I, didn't I think it's also like interesting, it like in, in, in this connection, the sort of like, artistic sort of you know standing back and looking at a piece and just say is it done well it's done you know i mean it, it, and also the sort of visuality of her writing and the the filmic nature it's interesting like that she was also a painter and there's art her some oh. of her art is on display plate paces and you can find it um and i wonder how that sort of influenced you know her writing uh both here and and elsewhere i was also thinking like and for all of you uh, legends that have made it this far in in, <laughs> in, the, in the discussion, um, spoiler alert preview, we're going to be discussing um, Helen DeWitt's The Last Samurai in a couple weeks. And oh, yeah. I was thinking about Kurosawa um, reading this and because specifically he made a movie called Dreams where he was sort of endeavored to kind of like commit some of his dreams to film. Yeah, and it's pretty generally regarded as one of his worst movies. <laughs> right, um, <yeah. laughs> and and I I just it made me think about how difficult it is to capture that feeling in any medium. Um, and 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 how well she does it here. It just it just added that that much more admiration on my part for what she's doing. I uh, well, not only that. Uh, go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. No, you go first, Paul. I was just going to say that, like, for for my own personal experience, like, I don't even have dreams like she does or did or potentially did. Like, her imagination, I thought, was just, like, off the fucking charts. The way, like, the way she interjected, like, something that I would think would end a sentence with a different word that made the whole paragraph, like, more profound was just like holy shit i i was i was pretty astounded by her imagination as a whole like i i just thought out of all the books we've read for book club i thought her imagination was just like off the charts like top notch how do you even think of this shit just a, just a quick example of what paul was talking about like just to, to sort of describing the the experience sorry matt i don't know if you still no, have no, your, no. Thought, your thought on hold but i, I just was hold i was just i was just flipping through and and i i found it a, a good example it seems to me this is on 130 paul uh it just says the dream closes into the central dead spot with delayed lingering uncertainty this is disclosed as perhaps a web spun with gray mist fibers of involution, perhaps a carcinoma, perhaps some sort of transparent maze. An uncertainty concentrates involution honeycombs into greatest possible number of hexagonal cells on a pyramidal base. As the honeycomb crystallizes, the cells quickly expand to differentiate. Involution now occupying the entire visual field defines into catacombs, hospital, prison, town with antique northern buildings. And I just thought that that was like just such an interesting like way of describing that the sort of experience of like what the, what am, you know that just the dream, the experience of being in a dream and not really knowing what you're looking at until you sort of inexplicably do. Yeah, and there's so many levels to that statement too. Just like so many descriptions Literally. on top of descriptions, and just like <laughs> I don't know. Like that was the whole book to me. It was just like I'm overwhelmed by her imagination. I I was gonna. Um do a bit of a counterpoint and say that like i'm a little cool on this book uh in general i liked it but like um i you know what and and i know there are reasons for this formally in the divinity student but i have a similar complaint and this could just be me uh sort of running into the wall of my own taste or something but like when we get to these kind of image heavy fucking like phantasmagoric fantasia like uh, a lot of words just sort of piled on top of each other in, in a descriptive sense. I, I get a kind of numbness to me that ends up just like making the whole experience in, in vast chunks of the book, pretty, pretty bland, like pretty uh, like I'm pretty unfeeling towards them. And it's, 
I don't know if I have like a, a, a low threshold for becoming like, quote unquote, overwhelmed by description, but um, I know when like they're trying to like in the divinity student, you know, they're, that's that's more about like that's kind of weirdly more about like language and words, literally like what their their ability to like uh, 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 convey meaning and, and whatever. So I, I get that having more of a function, but like, yeah, the, the experience was similar. It was just like, uh, just kind of getting bludgeoned a bit too much and kind of not caring after a while. Like I, I yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, I, 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 I definitely get that. And, you know, not, not to, um, invalidate your experience or anything, but I, <laughs> I do think, I don't do erase think that, me, please. I, no. Yeah. I do think there's a sort of sense these days when we've all been so sort of yeah you know vaccinated with um you know yeah like maximalist literature that just repeats the same line over with a word different for six pages or whatever the fuck that it just becomes overdone and numbing um or or describes the same thing 50 times slightly differently or whatever you know whatever sort of modern techniques um but i think that you know, I don't know. I think that it's, uh, I think historically it has to be like, like you have to take into account the, the, the time period you have to take into account the history when it was written all that. Sure. I mean, and I also think that we we've gotten to this point where, and I'm not saying you're doing this, but I think a lot of people have a sort of like, Oh yeah, I took a, I took a writing class. Like don't over describe that's, that's bad. That's bad writing. Right. Um, and I'm not saying you're doing that again, but I think there's, there's a risk of that sort of, thing with some of these texts yeah i i, I think oh paul you're you're uh muted again so i guess i just wonder the degree to which and again i'm not in your head i'm not invalidating your experience or whatever but i'm just saying like i wonder yes. that I, I i wonder how to parse the distinction between what you actually feel reading something and like your mind telling you this is on paper bad writing or something like that sure Do you yeah have a Paul, did you have anything to add to that? Well, yeah, I think that my differentiation between the, the Divinity Student and this book was, would be the, the plot structure. I think that like this book had like a very interesting like grounded plot structure with the inference of these little passages before each chapter. And also the accents of um, politically minded or just like theologically minded structures within the the text that that separates it from the the divinity student but i would also say that like you can't discount something for being overly word wordy and overly descriptive just just because like what what gabe was saying that that's just like what you should not do in the text okay i i, I uh, let me let me continue like yeah i i just i just think that like the text she was trying to 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 write it it was in this style it was in this over overly descriptive way o of doing overly? so yeah i mean I, I i mean i agree with you in some points that it was like but yeah there's a difference between there's a difference between objectively overly as in more than you need and uh, and overly in the sense that it makes me not enjoy reading it and i think that this was certainly the former, but not the latter for me. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I feel like I was in a lot of aspects. I was, I keep saying this, but I was, I was along for the ride with it. And I, I think that in a lot of different texts, like you couldn't read it twice and get, or you could, you could read this text twice and get a totally different view of what you just experienced. And I think that, it it almost like needs you to read it a couple times to like I think, keep getting I think that's something true. out of it yeah yeah I mean, no i mean i'm i'm again i'm hyper aware of what i might be bringing to the table as like a modern reader and whatnot um but i've had this now experience a couple times with books that we've read and outside of this uh that i've just read and um I, I, 
it's not that I like transcend anything, but just sort of like, I, I know that it's not just like some sort of a, a lit student fucking like don't over describe hang up. It's like, it's like, no, I actually experienced this differently in multiple forms. Uh, just people like using too many adverbs to, and like uh, stacking uh, lists, a lot of lists and stuff like of, of things and just trying to like create this foment uh, tends to have the problem where I, yeah, I, I don't know. I just sort of become benumbed to words in general and the ones that pro came preceded it or whatever, kind of like lose some of what could have been a punch to them. I'm, but I'm, I, don't, I don't dislike I'm, this book. I, no, 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 it's fine. I'm, and I'm not like, I don't, I, I, I didn't write it. I'm not offended, but I will be interested to see, uh, again, spoiler alert for the legends. I'm, I, I just want to, <laughs> I just want to, I just want to flag this discussion because I will be interested to see if you have that same reaction to the last samurai, because I'm about, I'm almost done with it. And it had like, if you're, if, if, cause if what you're complaining about is lists and stacking of things repetitively, I, yeah. I'm, I will be interested to see, cause I know you're, you're, your taste skews towards the sort of, you know, big kind of maximalist stuff, sure, um, yeah. which is a, which makes it sound a little bizarre to me at first blush to be complaining about stacked lists and repetitiveness. I'm just going to flag that and I'll be interested to revisit it later. Okay. I think and I would I, just, I, I would just say the flowery is the, is a description that maybe comes up the most as like close to what I'm talking about. Yeah. I, I think I understand that standpoint. Because I, I was thinking about Mirakami, because Mirakami is my favorite author. I'm a coomer. Um, nice, dude. <laughs> and he interjects dreamlike imagery within his novels in a very, like, I don't know, sporadic way that it makes you focus on them and, like, think about them while you're reading more mundane aspects of the novel. And I actually, like, I don't know, maybe like halfway through this book, I was like, oh my God, I wish that he, this author was uh, being a little bit more like Murakami and being like a little less heavy with the dream imagery because the whole fucking book is dream imagery. But then I, I kind of gave into it and I was like, you know, this is maybe not what I want to read in terms of my own taste. So I just want to accept what I'm reading. And it turned into like a different genre to me almost. It was like, this is this book is its own thing to me and it's it's doing its own thing and maybe it's not exactly what i like expect out of a novel a fiction novel but it's like it's doing something unique and i, I didn't think it was like flower flowery in the way that the divinity the divinity student was wow wine <laughs> 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 on uh on that note should we uh -na 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 -na. wait wait wait. oh please screw so, it Rash record scratch yeah chill for one second um so like first of all i think it would be important it's important like I, I maybe we've made it clear but like you know the b grows she's like a, a a little little tiny girl and she's probably like 21 by the end of the book firmly establishes herself as somebody within the night, but now with like some caveats and questions. And I just wanted to read one last highlighted thing that I had on uh, page PDF page 100. Um, again, where she's, she's again, this is my, maybe my hangup, but where she's a little less uh, imagistic and, and, and kind of like, it's feeling feels like she's just kind of literally just grappling with what she's doing in this book and uh we have a ah uh, how well one knows the whole horrid cycle from confidence to uncertainty to bewilderment and finally to utter chaos and despair what is the key to it all what attitude should one take up the fact is, and I suppose we must accept it that for the great majority it is impossible to find out anything about the authorities but to resign oneself to ignorance is indeed hard. Everyone knows that the authorities exercise supreme control over each one of us, even down to the most trivial details of our lives, and this is even specifically stated in the writings of our ancient teachers. Human beings can hardly be expected to refrain from trying to throw a little light on such vital mysteries, particularly as some unconscious impulse deep in our natures seems to be continually turning our thoughts in that direction. That that feels like the motivation by the time she's an adult 
that is that is fueling this particular book. Yep. I like that. And yep. I like that. I like that. Yeah, I think that's a good uh and also in some ways a good place to sort of end it. Sure. Maybe. The book itself or, or well, no, 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 no. In terms of like, yeah, right now, in terms of the discussion, just because I think that it's that's a, a, a good kind of summary of, like you said, the motivation both in text and extra textually. Sick. All right. I just wanted to sing. I just wanted to sing. You're you're a reader, Harry. <laughs> and we're in it. The segment. And we're in called... it. Paul. My me first. What is What's the, segment the name called? of the segment? Oh, uh, you read another book. No. Yes, basically. <laughs> <laughs> we just did read another book. We, we just, just I, did it. Yeah, it's a defensive. I, still, I have to. I have to admit, I don't totally understand the joke. Well, okay, Matt, do you want well, to explain? Ex- it? Should we explain? Let's explain it? Our- We've explained it once before, but it might do us. It might be worth doing it again. Well, there's a lot of layers to it. It's ironic on a couple levels. I would say that. Mostly people are just, uh, you know, when, when people compare, this is a like mostly political shit. Like people are comparing other, uh, uh, bad politicians to Voldemort and good politicians to Harry Potter and Hermione and Ron Weasley. Uh, there started to become this uh, complaint that no one had any other literary reference point in which to situate these battles. And that uh, all the like dumb shit lib people uh, only read Harry Potter. And so the complaint was read another fucking book. Uh, But also it spread out and we know we're annoying people who even would maybe care about what we're talking about by referencing Harry Potter at all. And so the joke is, Paul, now we literally just read another book and we get to indulge our cringe Harry Potter like lizard brains yes and and there's also like the the joke of like we literally like li- literally nice okay literature literally got it right yeah that li- yeah that's so, right three levels <laughs> slash lit slash slash lit know? slash yeah. Yeah. yeah um so this is the segment where we put all the main characters in the book we just read into a harry potter house and this should be quick because there's only three basically if that yeah, a, maybe four a. <laughs> a b um the liaison officer and maybe her dad i don't yeah i don't even know if i could do her dad like, yeah her dad's it. not in the book enough i don't think really no. well i mean t- to be honest this book almost rides the line of like should we make should we should we do this or should we make it like uh <laughs> I mean, that have we question, made a mistake? To, to be fair, that question can be asked every time we do this. Yeah. <laughs> Again, part of the no, joke. No, I was thinking more like, should we play the game of of uh, which director should direct this book? Oh, well, that's a, that's movie. another fun game that I do like, but I haven't thought about it yet. So I we have we have don't, don't put me on the spot. I was thinking Peter Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> Noah Bombach. I think Greta Gerwig should play B. Stop. <laughs> I just I just heard about the uh, the white noise adaptation. I don't want to hear about this crap yeah, anymore. Good lord. Um, but uh, Gryffindor for B. Yeah. Uh, why Gryffindor? Why? Just you know true to oneself steadfast uh you know has some moments of weakness that really drive home the appropriateness of her initial kind of response to the world and uh yeah ultimately she sticks with it for her whole life it's dark gryffindor i mean like yeah dark gryffindor it's kind of impossible to say that b just isn't anna kavan or whatever like you know uh, uh, ki- ki- a bit of a, a a wreck by the end of her life, but I think it's for brave reasons. 
yeah any anyone uh, else i mean i yeah i agree that she's a gryffindor for sure nice yeah i agree gryffindor i think that's i think this is a three for three uh nice. a a is the one i really have trouble with no fucking clue really i don't that's, know that's a tough one Again, she's a ghost. She's like a figment of her of B's imagination. Right. She's just part of B for ninety percent of the novel. So, how do we parse that? Like, well, Moaning Myrtle I mean, was a it, ghost, so that's true. You know, those are people that exist in the realm of yeah, Harry Potter. So that's a good. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, it's a bad point because she already <laughs> had a house. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a good point because nearly headless Nick. That makes no sense to me. Yeah, that's a good point. It's actually okay. Good. I'm gonna say uh, for for a. I'm gonna say um. I don't know. What's the most depressive house? Ravenclaw. I thought it was Hufflepuff. I thought Hufflepuffs were generally like jolly and affable. Yeah, I, but if I, you like, work in like... a, if you if you work in a factory and you're a Hufflepuff, which you if you work in a factory, you are a Hufflepuff, and you kill yourself. I, I just feel like most Hufflepuffs, most suicidal people are Hufflepuffs. No, <laughs> no I, you can't no. say that. Dude, I deeply disagree. Also, <laughs> just based on the characterization of Hufflepuffs. I think yeah. like if you have loyalty, that means you have ties to life no matter what you said. Hufflepuffs are the most likely people to be like, it's a cowardly act that True. leaves people that are alive feeling sad. I and disagree. I can't I can't huh. deal with that. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna what say Ravenclaw. She's a Ravenclaw. Ravenclaw. Goth. Goth Ravenclaw. I'm gonna say, yeah. I'm gonna. Say, I'm gonna say Hufflepuff. Fucking Wednesday Adams. Wrong. Ass. Wrong. <laughs> sad. Not wrong. Sad. <laughs> all. All Hufflepuffs can rape, and all. And most Hufflepuffs kill themselves. <laughs> all That's Hufflepuffs can rape. It is not. True. <laughs> How dare okay. you? All right, listen. Or, the beautiful segment we've created. God. <laughs> Our beautiful segment. You've the ruined beautiful it. segment. It's, beautiful. Everyone's talking about it. <laughs> um, the liaison officer is a... Hufflepuff. Hufflepuff, because he's loyal and he wears a uniform. He's basically a Nazi. Yeah, he's essentially... Yeah. He's a cop or a Nazi. Or he's something. a cop. Yeah, he's like a Nazi cop. And cop. isn't there an implication that her dad is abducted by cops or something? I didn't pick up on that. Anyway, never mind. Never mind. I don't want to. I don't want to go back and revisit. He's a Hufflepuff. Yeah, he's a Hufflepuff. I'm gonna say. Puff. I'm gonna say Gryffindor. Close. Uh, I'm gonna say Gryffindor. Okay, that's fine. You're <laughs> you're you're one for three this this round. So that's closer than right. suicidal. That's closer than suicidal. Hufflepuff. Yeah, that's true. I agree. He's yeah. closer than suicidal. Hufflepuff. Um, I think that's it for characters. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a uh, parochial setting. It's her brain. Yep. Uh, all right, let's all move right. to scores. Uh, I'll go last because it's my book. I think that's the new standard. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. I mean, my final thoughts on on this novella novel <laughs> are that it was it was highly imagined imaginative and uh, just fucking overall pretty amazing. And I thought it was uh, well written and well structured in a very unique way for 1947. I'm gonna give it a 4.48. Damn, damn. I just thought it was fucking. It was crazy. I I liked the the experience I had of like not being totally into it in the first like 40 pages, and then like it totally just overwhelmed me and i was like all right i'm here for this shit and Fair. uh i i especially knowing when it was written just made it like that much more enjoyable to me like this this girl this woman was just like off her rocker and so <laughs> like ahead of her time and uh I just thought it was fucking awesome. I don't know. I thought she was a cool, a cool writer. I need to stop drinking wine right now. <laughs> uh, well, finish what you got. Uh, 
that's basically it. I just thought that it was well written, beautifully written, maybe overly like whatever, like uh, too much, too many words, as Matt would say. Yep. <laughs> uh, but I thought that it worked. It it it, it uh, totally worked well. Uh, go ahead, Matt. I'm done. I'm gonna go with a uh, a three point four. Um, you know, I I'm trying to to weigh in all of the contextual elements so that I don't give it too. I, you know, I don't, I don't detract from it in any way. And uh, there are moments in the book that are, I think, like well worth the price of entry and uh you know i will hash it uh whatever chalk it up a bit to a, a kind of personal preference almost more than the failings of the book itself but like by and large it, it it's incredibly innovative for its time but still like i'm i'm i don't know i'm talking from 20 fucking 20 dude like Uh, it's a, it's a dream journal. 2020 dude. 2020 dude. Uh, I know it's 2021, but, um, the decade, yeah, you know, the, 20, so the 2020s, the 20s, the roaring 20s. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I thought it was a great book. I, I, uh, I have, it's some more than hanging. just a dream journal. It's more than just a dream journal, dude. I know. But do you, you know, the, the cliche about hearing people talk about their dreams? And uh, I thought about that when I read this book. Like, it, there's there's like a top five things you should not talk. Paul, to your about time right has now. expired. All right, fine. Fuck you. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, I'm Joe Biden, and I need my time to talk now. Uh, well, it's no, like, Joe it's Biden like, does not want his time. He wants to end his time. <laughs> it's like don't talk about the weather, don't talk about your family, right? And don't talk about your dreams. And that's like, well, you should not talk about at a party, right? It was just it. It was a it was a journalistic. It was a journal. Is what more would I'd say? It felt like a very incredibly personal account of a particular experience of of life. And uh, I don't know. Oh, yeah, three point four. That's what I'm giving it. Nice. Yeah, um, but so was uh so was um freaking uh the Jewish woman from the Holocaust. And that Frank. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Um. Uh, yep. I I, th I think it's a masterpiece. Uh, I think it sh is criminal that this is not taught alongside Kafka and Breton and Burroughs. Mm. And uh, I think it's better than most of the output of, of all of them. I think it should be on the curriculum with Nadja and Naked Lunch and The Trial. And it's a, it's a 4.83. It's a masterpiece and um, it's incredible. Sick. Lo love it, dude. Wow. Wow. Ooh. masterpiece status that's like that's pretty up there yeah yeah as, as video game donkey would say masterpiece masterpiece absolute masterpiece yes. yes yes uh yeah so that's it that's what i think that's what everybody thinks <laughs> i mean not everybody thinks what i think but you just heard what everybody thinks yeah so and... matt's wrong is what my, matt's off his rocker I'm off my rocker, dude. I might as well start doing fucking heroin. We have a disagreement. Dude. We, have a, we have a disagreement here. That's it. That's reality. It happens. Um, let's, we can, uh, we'll come back and nail Matt on his inconsistencies in two weeks. Yeah. Tune in yeah. for that. Tune in for the that'll, that'll real, like, when people are really pinching my, my, my toes at the, at this next, uh, next two weeks from now. And we'll have a guest <laughs> for that, for that episode, which will, which like will be Tim an added. An ad, yeah, that did sound, that was good. That was very Tim. <laughs> Um, anyway, any final thoughts, guys? No, I love talking to you guys. We love it. We love talking to each <laughs> we other. And we, we love talking to each other and we love what's happening. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Have a great, uh, Bye, guys, whatever. <laughs>